Welcome to Vibration Cinema, the alter destiny of film. Today is Julie Dash's birthday, so we are going to celebrate with the retrospective video covering her historical importance, what she means to me as a mentor, and a roundup of her work. Julie covers many facts of her life in the Regie Vida Memorial Lecture at the National Gallery of Art back in 2020, so I don't want to just recap her bio, but I do want to make note of the significant things that she just casually drops in this lecture, which I'll link below. Starting with her education, Julie is probably the most educated working American filmmaker. She has training in cinematography from the Studio Museum in Harlem when she was in high school, uh, production from CCNY, writing and producing from AFI, and directing from the Ethnocommunications Program at UCLA. She has special specialized knowledge of various aspects of filmmaking from some of America's premier training institutions and with working knowledge passed down from instructors and mentors as diverse as St. Clair Bourne, Slavko Vorkopich, William Friedkin, and Alessio Taylor. Julie's training makes her living American film history, both studio and independent, up through the mid-century. Additionally, Julie is the bridge between black independent New York film in the 60s and 70s to black LA film in the 70s and 80s and 80s and 90s black independent East Coast film with a sprinkling of Midwest legends, having trained under St. Clair Bourne uh, and mentored by Kathleen Collins in New York before taking part in the LA Rebellion and bringing actresses Barbara O, oh, Coralie Day, Casey Moore, Adisa Anderson from LA with her uh, to the set of Daughters with New York City-based actors like Tommy uh, Redman Hicks and Alva Rogers along with Michiganian-born actress uh, Bonnie Turpin and art director Michael Kelly Williams, power couple Cheryl Lynn Bruce from Chicago, and Alabama-born, Watts-raised Carrie James Marshall, also uh, star and are the uh, production designer, DC-based hairstylist Pamela Farrell, and DC-trained Mississippi-born cinematographer Arthur Jaffa, uh, also worked on the film, and of course, the Geechee girl herself, Verda Mae Smart Grosvenor did the food and makes a cameo in the film. To me, this is what makes Daughters so historically vital. It's a culmination of black independent cinema that emerged in the late 50s, which interacts with black independent theater, the black arts movement, third cinema, black public access television. These histories were atomized like a decade ago, LA versus New York, film versus theater, and as we discover more about these eras from its practitioners, I think we'll see just how closely knit these movements actually were. Julie's career broadly, but specifically Daughters as a work, is significant in that redirection. Daughters is considered the first uh, feature film by a black woman to have a wide theatrical release in the United States, but what's often overlooked about this historical first is the ingenuity it took to actually accomplish a wide release. An $800,000 production budget, $150,000 distribution budget, turning $3 million in ticket sales across 13 screens in 39 days, using local creatives and organizations to help set up fashion shows, pop-up bazaars, etc. It wasn't just like a movie, you know, go out to the movies one night, it's like a whole experience. And Julie and the distributors talk about this at the new school panel celebrating Daughters' 20th anniversary, which I'll link below if you want to find out more information about like the, the details of that. But old school method like, like these uh, date back to the turn of the century church circuit, uh, and Julie was able to tailor those methods for modern audiences. And if you get into the weeds about this model, you'll come out on the other side with many lessons applicable to today's digital and internet media landscape. I want to talk a little bit now about how much Julie means to me and my filmmaking practice and what it's like to be taught by her. 100% I would not be as confident a filmmaker as I am now without Julie as an educator. I try to model my teaching off of her so my students can feel a similar rush of um, confidence. She taught us in Howard signature class, Advanced Directing, which is usually the domain of Haile Garima, but Garima had retired by then, so he invited her to teach in his stead. Julie puts as much energy into her students as they put into their work, so much to my cohort's ire, I made sure that I had a new script, new camera test, new rehearsals, new drafts, something new every class to maximize my time with her. I sought as much advice from her as I could, and she was really receptive to my annoying insistence. And from this process of her guiding the production of Orchid Boys, Besides a couple of camera tricks and scheduling tips, she showed me how strong and curious my creative instincts are, and more importantly, ways in which to develop and refine the ideas I generate. She certainly didn't understand everything about Orchid Boys and what I was trying to do with it, but she listened to my intentions and gave productive notes to boost the vibrancy of an image or ensure the clarity of a scene. Words cannot encompass how lucky and privileged I am to have been under your tutelage, Julie, so I hope these videos can indicate, hint at even, the gravity of my appreciation of you. I want to take some time now to go through Julie's filmography, at least what I've 
been able to see and to give them a little shine, talk a little bit about what they mean to me, you know, things that I like about them, maybe an anecdote or two. Um, so let's get started. So starting with Diary of an African Nun, this is based off of an Alice Walker short story. Narration is one of Julie Staple's storytelling devices, and I think it's interesting how this titular diary is the only way that Sister Gloria has a voice. And as always, Julie is very playful with the narration. We think that this scene might be a flashback that Gloria is recounting in her diary, but it's actually present tense, a statement on how these girls' path might echo hers. Ron Flagg from Eve's Bayou and Deja Vu makes an appearance here. It's a black film student staple to have a close-up of a character's feet or shoes while walking. Uh, this is an incredible shot. Lord, the prayer montage reminds me of the work of Vorkapich, which was one who was one of Julie's uh, favorite teachers. And these credits are A1. This idea of a dancer in a cocoon came to Julie at the Studio Museum, uh, but she wasn't able to actualize that image until here with Four Women. Julie calls this a choreo poem, which is a film that also prefigured music videos in many ways. Dance is central to a lot of Julie's work, and she's a central tenant in uh, what I call kinesthetics. I like the soundscape aspect of this, but I'm adamant that Nina Simone is too cinematic for cinema, so I have to temper my appreciation of the craftsmanship here, unfortunately. But, you know, this is definitely the uh, exception to the rule. It's really beautiful, the choreography, the movement. We've been talking about how Julie bridges a lot of black cinema. And for this film, Sweetback's uh, director of photography, Robert Maxwell, shot this. And a PA from that set, when Winfrey Tennyson, produced this. The Illusions title card is ace, right? Illusions is about passing. Cinema is an illusory art form. Celluloid and the illusion of movement. Double, triple entendre. It's good. If you know me, you know I love reflections. So these shots are just chef's kiss. But there's actually quite a lot going on in this movie. There's a passing narrative that isn't just some boring, tragic mulatto story, where Mignon Dupree tries to force inclusive change inside the studio with her proximity to whiteness. And the film links the propaganda warmongering of Hollywood to its racist genocidal origins. As with Daughters, Julie loops in indigenous stories when Mignon pitches a film about the code talkers, which adds dimensionality to the film's critique of Hollywood while also expanding the scope of what Mignon wants to accomplish. This speculative Hollywood story is echoed in Cheryl Dunny's fictional archive creation in Watermelon Woman and the playful rewriting of history in Ryan Murphy's Hollywood. Breathes is another film with dance and aesthetics at its core. It's a music video for Sweet Honey in the Rock. It's a beautiful, beautiful elegy and eulogy for those who have died from complications with AIDS. I cry every time that I watch this. It's kind of intense the way that everything washes over you. And like the reading of the names at the uh, unfolding of the names Project AIDS quilt, the unveiling of which is interspersed here, the narrator singers incorporate names into the song like Marlon Riggs, Arthur Ashe, and Ray Navarro. We'll loop back to this video in a second, but first, Relatives is an example I would consider of Julie's griot storytelling structure some two years before Daughters is released. This is about choreographer Ishmael Houston Jones's family, uh, dance, narration as oral storytelling, telling lineage, all staple Julie themes and motifs are present here. I think what's really interesting about this is how Julie is able to capture and appreciate the subtleties of this of this family's history and these family traditions. She's really attuned to her subjects in a way that I, you know, at least for American filmmakers, is rarely seen. Julie made this film, Praise House, for public access television at the request of choreographer Joel Willa Joe Zoller, who wanted Julie to translate her idea to the screen. The cast is comprised mostly of Zoller's urban book Bushwoman dance troupe. As with so much of her early work, we have yet again dance and kinesthetics. This is probably Julie's most virtuistic work, the parallels between different movement types, the layering of images. It's really, really beautiful. And much like Daughters, it's a story of multiple generations of black women. Daughters' core team of AJ as cinematographer, Carrie James Marshall as production designer, and uh, Amy Carey as editor uh, are present here. Catherine Gund, formerly known as Catherine Saulfield, worked on this, and she's a founding member of the AIDS video activist group Diva TV, along with Greg Bordowitz and Ray Navarro. With Breathes and Praise House, Julie is also also adjacent to AIDS video activism, and with this and her work with St. Clair Bourne, we make the connection to black public access television. Sax Cantor Riff, I think, is my favorite work by Julie. 
It's so gentle but immediate. The way she handles death here again is so elegiac, especially making Charles' expression of personal grief palpable to the discreet assortment of people on the platform, both observers and people who respond to her call. I'm sure they zhuzhed this up a little bit in post, but her singing as a train unexpectedly passes by is in the mix. Excellent, excellent work by the on-set mixer who I can't find info on, but bar none, one of the best mixes in cinematic history. I love the lighting and the colors here. Uh, you know I love when uh, black people are overexposed. <laughs> this white guy is kind of hilarious. But there's not much for me to say. This is an iconic video, Give Me One Reason by Tracy Chapman. But on a more personal note, Julie's inclusion of lesbians on screen and off screen throughout her career is a big reason why I was comfortable making something like Orchid Boys with her. The semester before before I had her, there was a lot of homo antagonism at Howard. I have to say expressly not from Garima, but I felt free to push certain things because of Julie's body of work. And as an educator myself, I want to be mindful of what I put out into the world so that my students can feel the same weightlessness in their creations and not feel like they need to temper themselves because of perceived ism or phobia that I might have. Thinking of You by Tony Tony Tony, Something Julie talked to us about is folding scrapbooking visuals into her griot structure, making a kind of parallel between the two. And I think this is a very clear expression of that. It gives very collage and flipping through the family photo album, watching home movies vibes. I really like it. Funny Valentine's reunites Loretta Devine and Alfre Woodard from Maya Angelou's Down in the Delta. Once again, we are dealing with generations of black women in a migration story with most of her generational work. Here again, we have flashbacks and jumps in time. And though it's not central here, there is a scene where a character tries to negotiate their proximity to whiteness, as with diary and illusions. I think Julie really shows the complicated family history of migrations, how those who migrated north might yearn for a return to the idyllic south, but may find many sinister secrets unveiled, and how southerners can have have a gamut of reaction to their northern relatives upon return, jealousy, I told you so-isms, pride, you know, and how out of touch those who migrated north are from their from their roots. Love Song is another made-for-TV classic, a swirl legend masterpiece, complete with a cheap Billy Ray Cyrus knockoff named Billy Ryan. The Akon and Monica performance is great, and this marks the first time of four collaborations with DP David Klassen, Whoopi Goldberg's ex-husband, who would then go on to shoot Diary of a Mad Black Woman. Angela Bassett specifically requested Julie to direct the Rosa Parks story. It's incredible how much Julie is able to experiment with form, archival footage, and time in a made-for-TV movie for CBS, no less, especially when compounded by the fact that our biopics of our great tend to be sterile and played straight. There's an agility here that's really refreshing, and if it's one thing Angela's gonna be, it's lit. Standing at the scratch line is another migration story using suitcases as a metaphor for not only the physical luggage, but the cultural and familial luggages as well throughout the history of the um, Great Migration. Travel Note of a Geechee Girl hasn't been released yet, I don't believe, but it is a documentary that covers a uh, culinary anthropologist and food griot, Berta Mae Smart Grosvenor. Uh, it's titled After Vibration Cooking, Travel Note of a Geechee Girl, which is obviously the inspiration of this channel. And when Berta Mae passed in 2016, Julie invited the trio to help her film uh, The Remembrance Service down in DC. I was the boom operator, Timmy was the sound mixer, and LaDawn was the guest photographer. This was really such an incredible experience to, to, to not only be there to, to witness the memorial, but also to work with Julie on such an important documentary. With this Yukon commercial, we once again have dance as a central element to her work. I actually think it's genius to compare the handling of a Yukon to the gracefulness of a dancer. I don't know if that's true or not and how these vehicles drive, but it makes for a good selling point. This is a commercial for the Detroit Elders Project called Scraps of Memory, High Tea and History. It's really incredible how even in her commercial projects, she touches on her recurrent themes of, you know, multi-generations and, and family and, and griot storytelling. Not everyone is as curatorial with the bag. And finally, why the sun and moon live in the sky. It's been a trend since I think the mid aughts, I wanna say, where fashion houses and like fashion magazines make kind of movie commercials or branded content. And Julie made this with Chloe and Halle for Vogue. Oration narration, folk tales, and dance are still very present in her work, you know, even as recently as this year. For one last time, I want to re-emphasize that Julie's teachers take us from early silent American film 
to American New Cinema, and the lessons from those teachers that she's applied to her own craft takes us from mid-century independent film through public access television, tape, the development of music videos, made-for-TV movies, the branded content in the present day. Occasionally, she'll release older or rarer works on YouTube and Vimeo channels, and, you know, she did do a GoFundMe campaign for Travel Notes of Geisha Girl, so she's plugged into what we're doing today. She's one of the filmmakers who adapt very easily to changing industry styles, and that's very much a part of her teaching and tutelage as well. Through her films, seminars, interviews, lectures, and teaching, Julie is America's film griot. It is such an honor to have been taught and mentored by such an inspiring and encouraging soul. I want to wish you the happiest of birthdays, Julie. Thank you so much for all that you do, your work, your teaching, and your dedication to developing young voices. And that's it for today. Like, comment, and subscribe. Y'all better wish Julie a happy birthday. But in the next video, we're finally digging into kinesthetics. Love you all madly. See you in the next one.